ओम भूर्भुव स्वतुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देव नहीं धियो यो न प्रचोदया ओं शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स आई एम गोइंग टू make the first video on the teachings of bhagwan sri ramana maharishi in his own words so i start the first video during the half century and more of his life at tiruvannamalai Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharishi was visited by a constant stream of people from all parts of India and by many from the west seeking spiritual guidance or consolation in grief or simply the experience of his presence he wrote very little all these years but a number of records of his talks with visitors were kept and subsequently published by his ashram these are mostly in diary form with little arrangement according to subject the purpose of the present book is to build up a general exposition of the maharishi's teachings by selecting and fitting together passages from these dialogues and from his writings published as the collected works of sri ramana maharishi no distinction is made between the periods at which the maharishi made any statement and none is needed for he was not a philosopher working out a system but a realized man speaking from direct knowledge it sometimes happens that one who is on a spiritual path or even who has not yet begun consciously seeking has a glimpse of realization during which for a brief eternity he experiences absolute certainty of his divine immutable universal self such an experience came to the maharishi when he was a lad of 16 he himself had described it it was about 6 weeks before i left madurai for good that the great change in my life took place it was quite sudden i was sitting alone in a room on the first floor of my uncle's house i seldom had any sickness and on that day there was nothing wrong with my health but a sudden violent fear of death overtook me there was nothing in my state of health to account for it and i did not try to account for it or to find out whether there was any reason for the fear <clears throat> i just felt i am going to die and began thinking what to do about it it did not occur to me to consult a doctor or my elders or friends i felt that i had to solve the problem myself there and then the shock of the fear of death drove my mind inwards and i said to myself mentally without actually framing the words now death has come what does it mean what is it that is dying the body dies and i at once dramatize the occurrence of death i lay with my limbs stretched out stiff as though rigor mortis had set in and imitated a corpse so as to give greater reality to the enquiry i held my breath and kept my lips tightly closed 
so that no sound could escape so that neither the word i nor any other word could be uttered well then i said to myself this body is dead it will be carried stiff to the burning ground and there burnt and reduced to ashes but with the death of this body am i dead is the body i it is silent and inert but i feel the full force of my personality and even the voice of the i within me apart from it so i am spirit transcending the body the body dies but the spirit that transcends it cannot be touched by death that means i am the deathless spirit all this was not dull thought it flashed through me vividly as living truth which i perceived directly almost without thought process i was something very real the only real thing about my present state and all the conscious activity connected with my body was centered on that i from that moment onwards the i or self focused attention on itself by a powerful fascination fear of death had vanished once and for all absorption in the self continued unbroken from that time on it is the last sentence that is the most remarkable because usually such an experience soon passes although the impression of certainty that it leaves on the mind is never afterwards forgotten very rare are the cases when it remains permanent leaving a man thenceforth in constant identity with the universal self such a one was the maharishi soon after this change occurred the youth who was later to be known as the maharishi left home as a sadhu he made his way to trivandrumalai the town at the foot of the holy hill of arunachala and remained there for the rest of his life for a while he sat immersed in divine bliss not speaking scarcely eating utterly utterly neglecting the body he no longer needed gracefully however devotees gathered around him and for their sake he returned to an outwardly normal life many of them craving instruction brought him books to read and expound and he thus became learned almost by accident neither seeking nor valuing learning the ancient teaching of non duality that he thus acquired merely formalized what he had already realized he has explained this himself i had read no books except the parya puranam the bible and bits of thamanovar or thevaram by conception of ishvara was similar to that found in the puranas i had never heard of brahma sansara and so forth i did not yet know that there was an essence or impersonal real underlying everything and that ishvara and i were both identical with it later at trivandrum lai as i listened to the ribhu gita and other sacred books i learned all this and found that the books were analyzing and naming what i had felt intuitively without analysis or name perhaps something should be said about the maharishi's way of answering questions there was nothing heavy or pontifical about it 
He spoke freely and his replies were often given with laughter and humor. If the questioner was not satisfied, he was free to object or ask further questions. It has been said that the Maharishi taught in silence, but this does not mean that he gave no verbal expositions, only that these were not the essential teaching that was experienced as a silent influence in the heart. The power of his presence was overwhelming and his beauty indescribable and yet at the same time he was utterly simple, utterly natural, unassuming, unpretend, unpretentious, unaffected. For the sake of uniformity, the questioner has been referred to in the dialogue in his in this book as D standing for devotee, except in cases where the name is given or where for some reason the word devotee would not apply. The Maharishi has been referred to as B standing for Bhagwan since it was usual to address him by this name and in the third person. Actually, it is a word commonly used to mean God, but it is used also in those rare cases where a man is felt to be, as Christ put it, one with the Father. It is the same as the name for the Buddha commonly translated into English as the Blessed One. So far as is possible, Sanskrit words have been avoided and it usually has been possible. The purpose of this is to make the book easier to read and also to avoid giving the false impression that the quest of self-realization is some intricate science which can be understood only with a knowledge of Sanskrit terminology. It is true that there are spiritual sciences which have a necessary technical terminology, but, the, but they are more indirect. The clear and simple truth of non-duality which Bhagavan taught and the direct path of self-enquiry which he enjoined can be expounded in simple language and indeed he himself expounded them so to western visitors without having recourse to Sanskrit terminology. In the rare cases where a Sanskrit term has seemed necessary or useful in this book, its approximate meaning has been indicated in brackets so that no glossary is necessary. It may also be remembered that the English words enlightenment, liberation and self-realization have all been used with the same meaning to correspond with the Sanskrit word jnana, moksha and mukti. In places where the English of the source quoted seemed in Palisitas, it has been altered. This implies no infidelity to the text since the replies were mostly given in Tamil or other South Indian languages and later rendered into English. The meaning has not been changed. I start the main book, chapter 1, The Basic Theory. Readers of a philosophical turn of mind may find it strange to see the first chapter of this work entitled The Basic Theory. It may appear to them that the whole work should be devoted to theory. In fact, however, 
The Maharishi, like every spiritual master, was concerned rather with the practical work of training aspirants than with the expounding theory. The theory had importance but only as a basis for practice. Now, devotee puts a question. Buddha is said to have ignored questions about God. Maharshi replies, Yes, and because of this he has been called an agnostic. In fact, Buddha was concerned with guiding the seeker to realize bliss here and now rather than with academic discussions about God and so forth. Devotee, is the study of science psychology, physiology, etc. helpful for attaining yoga, liberation or by intuitive understanding of the unity of reality. Bhagwan Maharishi Very little. Some theoretical knowledge is needed for yoga and may be found in books. Put practical application is what is needed. Personal example and instruction are the most helpful aids. As for intuitive understanding, a person may laboriously convince himself of the truth to be grasped by intuition of its function and nature. But the actual intuition is more like feeling and requires practical and personal contact. Mere book learning is not of any great use. After realization, all intellectual loads are useless burdens and are to be thrown overboard. Preoccupation with the theory, doctrine, and philosophy can actually be harmful insofar as it distracts a man from the really important work of spiritual efforts by offering an easier alternative which is merely mental and which therefore cannot change his nature. What use is the learning of those who do not seek to wipe out the letters of destiny from their brow by enquiring, whence is the birth of us who know the letters? They have sunk to the level of a gramophone. What else are they, O Arunachala? It is those who are not learned that are saved rather than those whose ego has not yet subsided in spite of their learning. The unlearned are saved from the relentless grip of the devil of self-infatuation. They are saved from the melody of a myriad whirling thoughts and words. They are saved from running after wealth. It is from more than one evil that they are saved. Similarly, he had no use for theoretical discussion. It is due to illusion born of ignorance that man fail to recognize that which is always and for everybody the inherent reality dwelling in its natural heart center and to avoid in it and that instead they argue that it exists or does not exist that it has form or has not form, or is non-dual or is dual. Can anything appear apart from that which is eternal and perfect? This kind of dispute is endless. Do not engage in it. Instead, turn your mind inward and put an end to all this. There is no finality in disputation. Ultimately, even the scriptures are useless. The scriptures serve to indicate the existence of the higher power or self and to point the way to it. 
that is their essential purpose apart from that they are useless however they are voluminous in order to be adapted to the level of development of every seeker as a man rises in the scale he finds the stages already attained to be only stepping stones to higher stages until finally the goal is reached when that happens the goal alone remain and everything else including the scriptures become useless sometimes it is true he expounded philosophy in all its intricacies but only as a concession to weakness to those addicted to much thinking as he put it in self inquiry i had thoughts of quoting such an explanation here but found that it contained the passage the intrigue the intricate maze of philosophy of the various schools is said to clarify matters and to reveal the truth but in fact it creates confusion where none need exist to understand anything there must be the self the self is obvious so why not remain as the self what need to explain the non self and of himself he adds i was indeed fortunate that i never took to it that is philosophy had i taken to it i would i would probably be nowhere but my inherent inherent tendencies led me directly to enquire who am i how fortunate the world real or illusion nevertheless some theoretical teaching is necessary as the basis for the practical work of spiritual training with the maharshi this took the form of non duality in complete accordance with the teachings of the great sage sankara the agreement does not however mean that bhagwan was as a philosopher would put it influenced by sankara merely that the that the recognized sankara's teaching as a true exposition of what he had realized and knew by direct knowledge devotee is bhagwan's teaching the same as sankara's bhagwan bhagwan's teaching is an expression of his own experience and realization others find that it tallies with sri sankara's devotee when the upanishad say that all is brahma how can we agree with the sankara that this world is illusory maharshi bhagwan sankara also said that this world is brahma or the self what he objected to is one's imagining that the self is limited by the names and forms that constitute the world he only said that the world has no reality apart from brahma brahma or the self is like a cinema screen and the world like the pictures on it you can see the picture only so long as there is a screen but when the observer himself becomes the screen only the self remains sankara has been criticized for his philosophy of maya illusion without understanding his meaning he made three statements that brahma is real that the universe is unreal and that brahma is the universe he did not stop with the second the third statement explains the first two it signifies that when the universe is perceived apart from brahma that perception perception is false and illusory what is, what it amounts to is that phenomena are real when experienced as the self and illusory when seen apart from the self the self alone exists and is real 
The world, the individual and God are like the illusory appearance of silver in the mother of pearl, imaginary creations in the self. They appear and disappear simultaneously. Actually, the self alone is the world, the I and God. All that exists is only a manifestation of the Supreme. Devotee, what is reality? Bhagwan, a reality must always be real. It has no names or forms but is what underlies them. It underlies all limitations. Being itself limitless, it is not bound in any way. It underlies unrealities. Being itself real, it is that which is, it is as it is. It transcends speech and is beyond description such as being or non-being. He would not be entangled in apparent disagreements due merely to different viewpoint or mode of expression. Devotee, the Buddhist deny the world whereas Hindu philosophy admits its existence but calls it unreal. Is not that so? Bhagwan. It is only a difference of point of view. Devotee, they say that the world is created by divine energy Shakti. Is the knowledge of unreality due to the veiling by illusion Maya? Bhagwan. All admit creation by the divine energy, but what is the nature of this energy? It must be in conformity with the nature of its creation. Devotee, are there degrees of illusion? Bhagwan, illusion itself is illusory. It must be seen by somebody outside it, but how can such a seer be subject to it? So how can he speak of degree of it? You see various scenes passing on a cinema screen. Fire seems to burn buildings to ashes. Water seems to wreck ships. But the screen on which the picture are, pictures are projected remains unburnt and dry. Why? Because the pictures are unreal and the screen real. Similarly, reflections pass through a mirror but it is not affected at all by their number or quality. In the same way, the world is a phenomenon upon the substratum of the single reality which is not affected by it in any way. A reality is only one. Talk of illusion is due only to the point of view. Change your viewpoint to that of knowledge and you will perceive the universe to be only Brahma. Seeing now, being now emerged in the world, you see it as a real world. Get beyond it and it will disappear and reality alone will remain. At the last, except shows the postulate of one universal reality calls for the conception of a process either of illusion or creation to explain the apparent reality of the world. The world is perceived as an apparent objective reality when the mind is externalized thereby abandoning its identity with the self. When the world is thus perceived, the true nature of the self is not revealed. Conversely, when the self is realized, the world ceases to appear as an objective reality. That is illusion which makes one take what is ever present and all pervasive full to perfection and self luminous and is indeed the self and the core of one's being for non-existent and unreal. Conversely, that is illusion which makes one take for real and self-existent what is non-existent and unreal, namely the trilogy of world, ego and God. 
the world is indeed real but not as an independent self subsists self subsistent reality just as the man you see in a dream is real as a dream figure but not as a man to those who have not realized the self as well as to those who have the world is real but to the former truth is adapted to the form of the world whereas to the latter truth shines as the formless perfection and the substratum of the world this is the only difference between them as i recalled bhagwan saying sometimes that unreal mithya imaginary and real satyam mean and same but did not quite understand i asked him about it he said yes i do not yes i do sometimes say that what do you mean by real what is what is it that you call real i answered according to vedanta some uh, only that which is per- permanent and unchanging can be called real that is the meaning of reality then bhagwan said the names and forms which constitute the world continually change and perish and are therefore called unreal it is unreal imaginary to limit the self to these names and forms and real to regard all as the self the non dualist say that the world is unreal but he also says all this is brahma so it is clear that what he condemns is regarding the world as objectively real in its itself not regarding it as brahma he who sees the self sees the self alone in the world also it is immaterial to the enlightened whether the world appears or not in either case his attention is turned to the self it is like the letters and the paper on which they are printed you are so engrossed in the letters that you forget about the paper but the enlightened sees the paper as the substratum whether the letters appear on it or not this is still more succinct succinctly stated stated as follows the vedantins do not say that the world is unreal that is a misunderstanding if they did what would be the meaning of the vedantic text all this is brahma they only mean that the world is unreal as world but real as self if you regard the world as non self it is not real something whether you call it illusion maya or divine play leela or energy shakti must be within the self and not apart from it before living before living the theory of the world as a manifestation of the self devoid of objective reality it must be stressed once again that theory had importance for the maharishi only in so far as it helped a man's spiritual development not for its own sake cosmology as understood in modern physical sciences simply did not concern him the vedas contain conflicting accounts devotee the vedas contain conflicting accounts of cosmology ether is said to be the first creation in one place vital energy in another water in another something else in another how can all this be reconciled does it not impair the credibility of the vedas bhagwan different seers saw different aspects of truth at different times each emphasizing some view point why do you worry about their conflicting statements the essential aim of the vedas is to teach us the nature of the imperishable 
self and show us that we are that duty about the part i am satisfied bhagwan then treat all the rest as auxiliary arguments or as expositions for the ignorant who want to know the origin of things major chadwick was copying out the english translation of the tamil kavalal navanita when he came across some of the technical terms in it which he had difficulty in understanding he accordingly asked bhagwan about them and bhagwan replied these portions deal with the theories of creation they are not essential because the real purpose of the scriptures is not to set forth such theory they mention the theories of casually so that those readers who wish to may take interest in them the truth is that the world appears as a passing shadow in a flood of light light is necessary even to see the shadow the shadow is not worth any special study analysis or discussion the purpose of the book is to deal with the self and what is said about creation may be omitted for the present later sri bhagwan continued vedanta says that the cosmos springs into view simultaneously with him who sees it and there is no detailed process of creation it is similar to a dream where he who experiences the dream arises simultaneously with the dream he experiences however some people however some people cling so the nature of man no no however some people cling so fast to objective knowledge that they are not satisfied when told this they want to know how sudden creation can be possible and argue that an effect must be preceded by a cause in fact they desire an explanation of the world that they see about them therefore the scriptures try to satisfy their curiosity by such theories this method of dealing with the subject is called the theory of gradual creation but the true spiritual seeker can be satisfied with instantaneous creation the nature of man we come now to the very essence of theory the nature of man himself for whatever a man may think of the reality of the world or of god he knows that he himself exists and it is in order to understand and at the same time to perfect himself that he studies and seeks guidance the individual being which identifies its existence with that of the life in the physical body as i is called the ego the self which is pure consciousness has no ego sense about it neither can the physical body which is inert in itself have this ego sense between the two that is between the self or pure consciousness and the inert physical body there arises mysteriously the ego sense or i notion the hybrid which is neither of them and this flourishes as an individual being this ego or individual being is at the root of all that is futile and undesirable in life 
therefore it is to be destroyed by any possible means then that which ever is alone remains resplendent resplendent this is liberation or enlightenment or self realization devotee bhagwan often says the world is not outside you or everything depends on you or what is there outside you i find all this puzzling the world existed before i was born and will continue exist after my death as it has survived the death of so many who once lived as i do now bhagwan did i ever say that the world exists because of you i have only put to you the question what exists apart from yourself you ought to understand that by the self neither the physical body nor the subtle body is meant what you are told is that if you once know the self within which all ideas exist not excluding the idea of yourself of others like you and of the world you can realize the truth that there is a reality a supreme truth which is the self of all the world you now see the self of all the selves the one real the supreme the eternal self as distinct from the ego or individual being which is impermanent you must not mistake the ego or the bodily idea for the self devotee then bhagwan means that the self is god and in his next reply bhagwan as was his way turned the discussion from theory to practice although the present chapter is on the whole devoted to theory it seems appropriate to continue the dialogue so as to show how the theory was put to practical use bhagwan you see the difficulty self inquiry who am i is a different technique from the meditation i am shiva or i am he i rather emphasize self knowledge for you are first concerned with yourself before you proceed to know the world or its lord the i am he or i am brahma meditation is more or less mental but the quest for the self of which i speak is a direct method and is superior to it for the moment you get into the quest for the self and begin to go deeper the real self is waiting there to receive you and then whatever is to be done is done by something else and you as an individual have no hand in it in this process all doubts and discussions are automatically given up just as one who sleeps forgets all his cares for the time being the further discussion illustrates the freedom of argument that bhagwan allowed to those who were not convinced by a reply devotee what certainty is there to what certainty is there that something awaits there to receive me bhagwan when a person is sufficiently mature he becomes convinced naturally devotee how is this maturity to be attained bhagwan various ways are prescribed but whatever previous development there may be earnest self inquiry hastens it devotee that is arguing in a circle i am strong enough for the quest if i am mature and it is the quest that makes me mature this is an objection that was often raised in one form or another and the reply to it again emphasizes that it is not theory that is needed but practice bhagwan the mind does have this sort of difficulty it wants a fixed theory 
to satisfy itself with it. Really, however, no theory is necessary for the man who seriously strives to approach God or his true self. Everyone is the self and indeed is infinite. Yet each person mistakes his body for his self. In order to know anything, illumination is necessary. This can only be of the nature of light, however. It lights up both physical light and physical darkness. That is to say, that it lies beyond apparent light and darkness. It is itself neither, but it is said to be light because it illuminates both. It is infinite and is consciousness. Consciousness is the self of which everyone is aware. No one is ever away from the self and therefore everyone is in fact self-realized only. And this is the great mystery. People do not know this and want to realize the self. Realization consists only in getting rid of a false idea that one is not realized. It is not anything new to be acquired. It must already exist or it would not be eternal and only what is eternal is worth striving for. Once the false notion I am the body or I am not realized has been removed, supreme consciousness or the self alone remains and in people's present state of knowledge they call this realization. But the truth is that realization is eternal and already exists here and now. Consciousness is pure knowledge. The mind arises out of it and is made up of thoughts. The essence of the mind is only awareness or consciousness, however, when the ego overclouds it, it functions as reasoning, thinking or perceiving. The universal mind not being limited by the ego has nothing outside itself and is therefore only aware. This is what the Bible means by I am that I am. The ego ridden mind has its strength and sapped and is too weak to resist distressing thoughts. The egoless mind is happy as we see in deep dreamless sleep. Clearly, therefore, happiness and distress are only modes of the mind. Devotee, when I seek the I, I see nothing. Bhagwan, you say that because you are accustomed to identify yourself with the body and sight with the eyes, but what is there to be seen and by whom and how? There is only one consciousness and this when it identifies itself with the body, projects itself through the eyes and sees the surrounding object. The individual is limited to the waking state. He expects to see something different and accepts the authority of his senses. He will not admit that he who sees the object seen and the act of seeing are all manifestations of the same consciousness, the I, I. Meditation helps to overcome the illusion that the self is something to see. Actually, there is nothing to see. How do you recognize yourself now? Do you have to hold a mirror up in front of your self to recognize yourself? The awareness is itself. The I realize it and that is the truth. Devotee, when I inquire into the origin of thoughts, there is the perception of the I, but it does not satisfy me. Bhagwan, quite right, because this perception of I is associated with a form, perhaps with the physical body. Nothing should be associated with the pure self. The self is the pure reality in whose light the body, the ego and all else shine. When all thoughts are stilled, pure consciousness remains over. Devotee, how did the ego arise? Here is a question that gives rise to endless philosophizing, but Bhagwan, holding rigorously to the truth of non-duality, refuses to admit it, admit it 
existence bhagwan there is no ego if there were you would have to admit of two selves in you therefore there is no ignorance if you enquire into the self ignorance which is already non existent will be found not to exist and you will say that it has fled sometimes it is seem to the listener that absence of thought must mean a mere blank and therefore bhagwan specifically guarded against this absence of thought does not mean a blank there must be someone to be aware of that blank knowledge and ignorance pertain only to the mind and are in duality but the self is beyond them both it is pure light there is no need for one self to see a other there are no two selves what is not the self is mere non self and cannot see the self the self has no sight or hearing it lies beyond them all alone as pure consciousness bhagwan often cited man's continued existence during sleep deep dreamless sleep as a proof that he exists independent of the ego and the body sense he also referred to the state of deep sleep as a body free and ego free state devotee i do not know whether the self is different from the ego bhagwan in what state were you in the deep sleep devotee i don't know bhagwan who does not know the waking self but you don't deny that you existed while in deep sleep devotee i was and am but i don't know who was in deep sleep bhagwan exactly the waking man says that he did not know anything in the state of deep sleep now he sees objects and knows that he exist but in deep sleep there were no objects and no spectator and yet the same person who is speaking now existed in deep sleep also what is the difference between the two states there are objects and the play of the senses now while in deep sleep there were not a new entity the ego has arisen it acts through the senses sees objects confuses itself with the body and claims to be the self in reality what was in deep sleep continues to be now also the self is changeless it is the ego which has come between has come between that which rises and sets is the ego that which remains changeless is the self such examples sometimes give rise to the mistaken idea that the state of realization or abidance in the self which bhagwan prescribed was a state of nescience like physical sleep and therefore he guarded against this idea also bhagwan waking dream and sleep are mere phases of the mind not of the self the self is the witness of these three states your true nature exists in the sleep devotee but we are advised not to fall asleep during meditation bhagwan it is a stupor which you must guard against that sleep which alternates with waking is not the true sleep that waking which alternates with sleep is not the true waking are you awake now no what you have to do is to wake up to your true state you should neither fall into the false sleep nor remain falsely awake bhagwan though present even in sleep the self is not then perceived it cannot be known in sleep state way it must first be realized in the waking state for it is our true nature underlying all the three states effort must be made in the waking state and the self realized here and now it will then be understood to be the continuous self uninterrupted by the alteration of waking dream and deep sleep in fact one name for the true state of realized being is the fourth state existing eternally beyond the three states of waking dream and deep sleep it is compared with the state of deep sleep since like this it is formless 
and non-dual. However, as the above quotation shows, it is far from being the same. In the fourth state, the ego merges in consciousness as in sleep it does not unconsciousness. So, to sum up what we have learned from this theoretical part, Brahma and Atma are real. Mind and ego, they are originated from Atma. When a person is sleeping, that time his mind and ego are not in function. So, the difference between the waking state and sleeping is that during waking state, our ego comes into action. Otherwise, there is no difference. Our consciousness, that is Atma, is the same when we are sleeping, it is the same when we are in the waking state. And as Bhagwan always used to emphasize more on the practical side, practice side, he always used to avoid mere theoretical aspect because theory leads to confusion and confusion only. When in actual sense we start exercising self-enquiry, then the knowledge which is our consciousness comes into opening. Because our consciousness is full of spiritual knowledge. Make sure, be definitive for this. Because your Atma is your real Guru. Real Guru. Our ancient sages, they have produced Vedic knowledge. Where from? It was all intuitive knowledge. Because already Atma of everybody is having this spiritual knowledge. But due to ignorance, we are not able to utilize it. And what is the realization actually? Here there is a confusion. See, already we are realized. What we have to do? We have to remove the confusion and ignorance that we are not realized. This confusion that we are not realized, that is the main blocking stone. It is blocking our flow. It is blocking our progress. So, make sure that we are already realized. For when we say that we are realized, we are not getting anything new because our Atma is permanent, changeless. When we say we are realized, does not mean that our Atma is changed. No, Atma is the same. So what we have done? We have removed the confusion and the ignorance that we are not realized. So this is, in realization, we are not receiving anything new, but only thing we are removing the ignorance. So know for that our Atma is real, our consciousness is real, our mind and ego, they are creating all sorts of confusion. So try to take your mind and ego to the Atma and 
फोर्स देम टू मर्ज विद द आत्मा देन व्हाट विल बी लेफ्ट ओनली आत्मा एंड दैट इज कॉल्ड सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन वेरी वेरी सिंपल थिंग बट वी आर कंफ्यूज्ड बिकॉज़ वी लव थ्योरी एंड दिस थ्योरी मेक्स आवर माइंड कंफ्यूज्ड एंड कंफ्यूज्ड ओनली सो सिंपली सिट फॉर मेडिटेशन एंड Go for self inquiry. Who am I? Simple. After a few days or few months, you will start getting the bliss and peace. So thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and share the video and subscribe the channel. Thanks a lot, my dear friends. Namaskar.